What you're seeing here is what aviation physiologists have labeled as myoclonic convulsions. Aviators just call it the funky chicken. It's what happens to the human body when oxygen returns to the brain following G-induced loss of consciousness, better known by the acronym G-LOG. An aviator doing the funky chicken behind the controls of a high-performance military aircraft isn't in control of that aircraft. If he's in the middle of a dogfight, he's likely to get shot by his opponent because he's no longer fighting his jet. And if he's at low altitude, he's likely to fly into the ground, as this Blue Angel did when he blacked himself out while trying to salvage a rendezvous during an air show in 2007. The advent of fly-by-wire aircraft made of composite materials has allowed modern fighters to pull 9 Gs or more, and fatal mishaps due to pilots experiencing G-Lock have risen. In short, G-Lock kills. The acceleration due to the force of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, and the force of gravity is 9.8 newtons per kilogram of mass. Of course, newtons named for Sir Isaac Newton, who realized gravity was a thing after the apple hit him on the head. Now G is the measure of that force. So an object that weighs 200 pounds at 1 G weighs 600 pounds at 3 Gs. Now as far as carrier aviators go, of the axes that involve G, there are two that are in play more or less. First one is the x-axis. So particularly during a catapult shot and an arrested landing, carrier aviators experience more than one G. But when we're talking about G-lock, we're normally referring to the Z-axis. So what is the effect of Z-axis G on aircrew? So let's go to the training aids. We have our legacy Hornet on a stick here, flying around straight and level, that's one G. Now as we start to maneuver the airplane, depending on how hard we pull, we can counter the natural force of gravity in multiples up to eight or nine G's, depending on the kind of airplane we're flying. So again, doing the math, a 200 pound pilot at nine G's suddenly weighs 1800 pounds. So if you've never felt the crush of G, just try to get your head around that number. So as this pull in the Z axis starts to affect the aviator, blood and the associated oxygen is pulled out of the brain. And this will initially cause loss of vision, tunnel vision, graying out, blacking out where you can't see at all, to full up G-induced loss of consciousness. So none of those things are any good. I'm reminded of one of my earliest ACM flights when I was in the Tomcat rag and I was looking over my shoulder and my instructor pilot put on the G and I blacked out. I was still conscious but I just couldn't see. And so he asked me, where's the bandit? And I said, I don't know, I'm blacked out. And that was a bad answer. He got on me to work harder on proper anti-G techniques so I wouldn't lose my vision because losing your vision could result in getting shot down in that case. So let's talk first about some of the gear that aviators wear that can help us fight the G. You remember in the episode where I went into my flank gear bag, I broke out my G suit. This is actually an Air Force style G-suit. It's made of sort of a cloth material. As I mentioned in that episode, it zips from high to low, unlike a Navy G-suit that's made of Nomex that zips from low to high. Minor difference, although this is a more convenient G-suit. But the way it works is the same. It plugs into the side of the airplane and with the onset of G, Air is vented into the G-suit and the bladders constrict around the abdomen and legs to try to keep blood from pooling in your lower extremities and try to assist the aviator with keeping blood and oxygen in the brain. So a good G-suit will increase G-tolerance by about two and a half Gs. So that means it fits correctly. And oh, by the way, it needs to be plugged into the airplane. I have forgotten that on occasion. And the Air Force is also designing what they're calling the Advanced Tactical Anti-G Suit, ATAGS, which is supposed to increase G tolerance by another G beyond the two and a half Gs. So that'll give them three and a half Gs beyond what you would have without the G suit. So that's pretty good. The ATAGS fits better and blows up faster with the onset of G. That's where you get that additional G of tolerance. As I mentioned before, when I first started my air combat maneuvering training, 
I experienced a blackout, but I quickly learned how to stay fully conscious in the high-G environment. Like most things, except for maybe the sport of golf, the more you do it, the better you get at it. The F-14 was a six and a half G airplane, and I have a number of hours in the F-16N, which is a nine G airplane. In fact, during several of those F-16 flights, we pulled so many Gs that we wound up with what you call G measles, which are caused by the pooling of blood at the base of your forearms that bursts the capillaries. But in my thousands of hours of tactical jet time, I only had full up G lock one time. And fortunately for the viewers of the channel, that episode was captured on videotape. The date was September 12th, 2012. I was in the back seat of Blue Angel number no. four, flown by Major Brent Stevens, call sign face. Watch this. Oh, it's okay. Here we go. Okay, rapid onset of seven and a half G's here. I'm already behind the airplane. And Mooch is out for the count. Slight funky chicken here. Saying a person's name is a good way to get them focused following G Lock. Since this is an actual performance, there are more high G maneuvers to come, so I gotta keep working hard here. All right, like with most things on this channel, I'm happy to present this content for educational purposes, but I gotta put out a few alibis. First off, this was my first tactical jet sortie since my final Tomcat flight, so that means 14 years have passed. Second, the Blue Angels don't fly with G-suits, so I wasn't flying with a G-suit, so this was my first and only time I'd ever flown a high G sortie without one. Lastly, while Face gave me a heads up since I wasn't flying the airplane and had never done this routine before, I had no idea how fast the G would come on or how long it would last, which is kind of like your trainer at the gym making you do crunches without a time limit, so you have no idea how to pace yourself. Andy G techniques have varied over the decades. When I first started flying, we were told, just clench your abdomen and your legs, and later that was modified into what we called the hook maneuver, which was basically say the word hook as a way to keep blood from pooling in your abdomen. So basically you would say hook, hook. But in time, the aviation physiologist determined that was inefficient. So now the technique is a combination of isometrics and timed breathing. Let's watch some examples of aviators doing the latest anti-G maneuvers properly. These videos were shot in a centrifuge, which wasn't a part of the official training during my time in tactical jets, but it's training that some, if not all, aviators go through now. In addition to hearing the effort of the aviator, you'll also hear the voice of the physiologist coaching them on the proper techniques. Let's watch. Just drop your shoulders. Breathe. Just count them off on your own. Breathe. Count them off on your own. And you're coming down this time. Keep your legs sticking, glutes engaged, all the way down. Legs sticking, glutes engaged, all the way down. On top, three. One, two, three. Out there, get the legs, butt, stomach tight, breathe. One, two, three. You gotta want it now. Work hard for me. Keep it all tight. One, two, three. Release the stick, terminate, bring it on down. Good job. You're on top, breathe. Plank those abs, squeeze your butt. Breathe. Drop the shoulder, squeeze your knees. Breathe. Squeeze your butt and abs. Breathe. Don't breathe in between. Breathe. And hold your strain, you're coming down. Hold the strain, you're coming down. Keep the pressure, keep it on top, breathe. Keep up the good work, last low. Nice job, 10 seconds. Three seconds, yeah. Breathing normal, more or less. Uh, yeah. Just make sure you keep your legs and butt, stomach strained all the time. 
20 seconds. 25. And there we go down again. So the lesson there is effective anti-G straining maneuvers can increase G tolerance by up to three Gs. Two components. First, breathing. Rapid, which means less than one second. Exhalation and inspiration cycles every three to four seconds. This maintains oxygen content and decreases carbon dioxide in your blood while also relieving increased pressure of the chest and allowing the heart to refill with blood. Two, isometric contractions. Flexing of the muscles of the legs and the abdomen. This step increases pressure in the chest, displaces blood away from these contracted muscles into the arms, chest, and brain. So in addition to proper fitting G-suits, good G-lock training, and well-executed anti-G straining maneuvers, the defense industry has come up with what they call the ground collision avoidance system. Here's a graphic that shows how it works. First, it detects imminent ground impact and prompts the pilot to take action. Secondly, if the pilot's unresponsive, the system assumes temporary control to pull the aircraft out of harm's way. Third, once at a safe trajectory and the pilot is responsive, the system returns control to that pilot. So let's watch this heads-up display footage from an F-16 that was saved by GCAS. The scale on the left side is the airspeed. The scale on the right side is altitude. The amount of G is blacked out, but it was most likely 9 or so when the pilot experienced G-lock. As he plunges downward, you can hear the flight lead, Sully 1, call for him to recover a couple of times. He's upwards of 55 degrees nose down, accelerating through 670 knots at less than 4,800 feet when the system takes over. So watch this HUD footage. Fuel recover. Fuel recover. Fuel recover. Fuel recover. Sully knock it off, Sully one knock it off. Sully two knock it off. Two, get yourself back above the floor. The ground control avoidance system is great technology that will save airplanes and more importantly, pilot lives. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. Give me the likes and comment. Check the links below for merch and where to get The Punks Trilogy, my first three novels about life in an F-14 squadron. If you buy it from usni.org, which I recommend, use the discount code PUNKYT for 25% off. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the Super Thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.